So just to introduce myself, my name is Lorraine McCourt. I'm the director of the Joint uh, Secretariat with NSUPB, and that is a very particular way of saying that I'm effectively responsible for program implementation, both of the current programs which are in the process of winding down, and now the uh, commencement of the Interreg 5A program as well. Now I have a number of colleagues here with me today, and I'm going to embarrass them completely by asking them to make themselves known. I'm supported here with, uh, by Brenda Hegarty, uh, my colleague, who's based down in the OM office. Brenda is a program manager and she's going to be responsible for taking forward the health theme and delivering that through. We also have Lynn Comack here today, also based out of the OM office. Is Lynn in the room? And Kathy Kelly as well. So they will be around. There's Kathy down the back. They will be around today. If you want to ask any questions, touch base, leave contact details, um, please feel free to find a member of staff. And down at the back, we have John McCandless as well from our communications team, who would also be happy to assist. As you can see over here on my right hand side, um, we have a number of flip charts. That today is for one purpose only, and it's to give you an opportunity that as we go through the course of the morning, we're going to be explaining to you some of the opportunities that may be available to you under the programme in terms of funding. We've got a large number of um, people represented here today, a lot of different organisations. Some of you may know each other, some of you may not. What we're basically asking you to do, if you would like to, is we're making the flip charts available today so that you can identify if there's a particular strand of the programme under the health theme that you would have an interest in. You can leave a project idea, you can leave your contact details, leave that behind, and we, what we will do is we will take that down, we will summarise that, and again, we will make that available later on. So if you are looking for other people who are interested in the same thing that you're interested in, or who might share your project idea and want to become uh, a partner within a project, leave your details on one of those flip charts and we will try and get that information out around all of you later on. Okay. We have today with us, um, myself and Brenda, as much as we are actively interested and delighted to be delivering out on this health theme for Interreg 5A, we do not come from a health background in terms of delivering uh, health care. But we are delighted that we have a number of colleagues here with us from each of the government departments in Northern Ireland, Ireland and Scotland who are working alongside us to give us policy direction and make sure that what we are identifying here as opportunities under the programme is aligned within the policy direction of each of the member states in which we're going to be working. And I'm going to read out a few names. So again, if you could give a wave and make yourselves known. Um, from Northern Ireland, we have John Farrell, Stephanie Johnson and Wendy Robinson. Uh, from the DHSSPS. From Ireland, we have Audrey Hegarty, and I think Audrey's on her way. She's just coming in on the train, so she may not be here just yet, um, but she'll be joining us shortly. And from Scotland, we have got Margaret Whiskey, Eddie Turnbull, Alistair Hodgson, Moira Hodgson, and Chris Wright. So again, government reps are here today. Um, please do wander around, make yourselves known during the coffee break, and if you want to ask any questions in terms of how your particular project idea might align within some of the government policies, some of the priorities in terms of moving forward and transforming care, please feel free to go and find um, one of those reps today and we will try and signpost you where we can. They are available to answer questions, talk to you, and I'm sure they'll be very happy to follow up with you um, after today's event. What I would like you to do, just for a moment, um, we were delighted uh, at the end of last week when we thought we had about 50 people who were coming along here today. Um, we were slightly overwhelmed when we got into the region of nearly 100, um, which is a, an amazing way of demonstrating the degree of interest, need and relevance of this particular area of the programme in terms of what we could potentially deliver out for the benefit of our communities. But we have a wide range of different interest um, stakeholders here today. I'm going to ask you to take two minutes just to introduce yourself to the other people around your table and give them a sense of why you're here and what you might be interested in, just to break the ice and get things started. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of minutes just to do that. That's as close as you're going to get to speed dating today. Okay, so what I would suggest is obviously you probably have hardly had a chance to find out who's with you. Do take an opportunity as we go through the course of the morning. All right. Take an opportunity as you go through the course of the morning to continue your speed dating, find out who else is in the room, and what I would maybe suggest even when you come back from the coffee break, it wouldn't do any harm to swap a table and find if you can get another um, angle on who else is here at another table after coffee. All right. 
Okay then, just to kick off, because we've got a lot of information to get through this morning, and I'm just going to explain to you what information you physically got within your packs, because there's quite a lot there. Some of which we're going to reference um, as we're going through the presentation, some of which we're just going to leave for you to take away and uh, read at your leisure, and you may well then want to come back with questions to us at a later stage. So within your pack of information, um, what you have got there is you have got a copy of this morning's presentations. You also have a summary fact sheet on the Interreg 5A programme. You have got a copy of the citizen summary, which gives you an indication of each of the um, results, the key elements of work that we're aiming to deliver under each of the themes under Interreg 5A. And within that, obviously, um, there is a detail there in relation to the health theme. What I would say, however, and I'm going to make no apology right up front, um, the citizen summary is just that. It is a summary. If you're actively interested in wanting to bid into the programme, I would strongly recommend to any of you who wish to do that to go onto the website and also take a look at the cooperation programme. It's not the easiest read. I'm sorry. It, it's just the way that it is. It was, it's in the format that it's in because it's a requirement of the European Commission, and that's the way that they had identified all cooperation programs needed to be submitted. So it's not the easiest one to follow your way through, but if you go into that program document and find the section on health and just make sure you've read down through that so you've got the full level of detail and you, you read just the particular nuance that was coming out from the Commission. It's, it's a bit of a hard read, but it's very, very worthwhile to take that effort and go and do that. You've also got within your pack a sample application form. The one that you've got there is the application form which has gone out for the SME call. Um, it will obviously be looked at again in respect to the health call, um, but I would just say that it's going to be a pretty standardised form, so there shouldn't be any significant variation. And what you've got there will give you a good sense of the questions that we're going to ask at stage one. But in addition to that, what you've also got there is you've got... A guidance document on how to prepare a business plan. Now Brenda is going to explain the application process to you later on this morning. Um, both of those documents are going to be quite important for you and whenever you come through with a detailed submission at stage two, that guidance document gives you a sense of the kind of information that we will be looking for you to provide so that we are able to form a, an informed judgment on the merits of your project proposal and that the committee are in a position to make a determination as to whether or not it is a project that should be financed which will deliver and which will deliver quality output at a good value for money cost. You also have a call timetable uh, within your pack. That's what we have identified at the moment as being our schedule. So we are looking at an early October date for the opening of the health call. And you'll see then the steering committee dates and also the stage two dates in there as well. And you also have a little document there on our other programs, which we uh, facilitate through SUPV, through the transnational program, which may or may not be of interest to either yourself or someone else that you know. So there's just a little bit of a reference document in there as well. So there's quite a lot of information within the pack. Um, we're not going to go through it all today. We simply would not have time, but it's there. Feel free to come back to us again if you need to at a later stage. So we also have an agenda here for you today. What we're aiming to do with you this morning is we are going to take you through and I'm going to talk you through the programme priorities in respect to health and just how that fits within the overall programme itself. We're going to look at the policy context within which all of this activity is set. We're going to then look at, and I'm sorry, it is quite wordy on the slides, but we felt it was useful to do that because it is a translation out of the cooperation programme and once we start trying to summarise that anymore, it, you, know, you run the risk that you maybe start to lose a little bit of the nuance there. So we're going to talk you through each of the outputs and the indicators that are talked about in the cooperation programme. So you've got those there for your reference. And then I'm going to hand over. We've got the um, governmental reps are going to come up and give you a little bit of a sense of the policy context. We will then break for a cup of coffee, give you an opportunity again to have a chat between yourselves. And then whenever we come back... Some of you may have decided to run for the hills at that point and think, no, this is not for me, in which case, thank you so much for coming. It was lovely to have you. We very much hope, however, that the majority of you will come back into the room. And if you do, Brenda is going to talk you through the application process and give you a sense of what's involved in that and how we are going to score and look at applications whenever they arrive with us. So we'll do that. Um, we'll then give you another opportunity for a question and answer session. We'll break for lunch. Again, feel free to take that opportunity to network with us or network with your other colleagues in the room. 
and then we are hanging around for a little while after we have completed the formal business today. There will be members of staff available if you want to come on a one-to-one -one basis and ask any particular questions in respect to your project. Now, obviously, we have a lot of people here today. We might not be able to deal with everybody if everybody wants to come and avail of that opportunity. But if we can't get you, please do not worry. You can come back contact Brenda or any other member in the, uh, of the team in the OMA office and we will try and arrange for follow-up conversations with you after today's event. Okay, does that sound like a plan? Everybody happy? All right. Okay, just to give you a sense then in terms of the programme, um, we are absolutely delighted um, to be here today and I have to be honest and say that when I started out in my career, which was uh, very different to what I'm doing right now, I never envisaged a time when I would be standing up in front of you this morning saying, would anybody like to avail of an opportunity of 53 million euros worth of finance from the European Commission? It was not part of the life path that I thought that I had set out for myself, but I am delighted to be here today to open that opportunity. We have an amazing chance now to do something very meaningful, to create impact, to deliver within the health sector and to try and deal with some of the issues which are relevant um, to our region, where within the cooperation programme you will see that the backdrop here is that we, despite best efforts on behalf of all of you who are working in the sector, we do have health inequalities within our population. We do have difficulties in providing the level and the type of care that we would always like to provide in the way that we would like to provide it. We have an added complication between Northern Ireland and Ireland in that we have got a border. We have got issues in Western Scotland in that, similar to the border region here, there's a disparate population which makes it very difficult to provide access to care close to people's homes. And we need to find ways in which we can move forward with all of that, provide a level of care which is consistent, which is best practice, which actively provides what people want and need, and where we can avail of the new technologies and the new opportunities that we have through telehealth, e-health, to really get care out to people closer to their own home. We've now got an opportunity through the Commission, and with some match finance which needs to go against that, to go out and make significant investment in that area. But there is a challenge within all of that. There's a way in which we need to do it. And what's different for this programming period compared to where we were before is that the European Commission, whenever they were negotiating budgets for all of the programmes that they finance, found this time that they had quite a difficult time in being able to secure that finance, be able to agree budgetary provision. And one of the main reasons why was that it was difficult for them to articulate to all of the various stakeholders that they had to convince that the investment of this finance in all of the cooperation programmes across Europe makes a demonstrable difference, that it has an impact, that it actively moves the status of where we're at within each of the different sectors forward into a new place and a new way of being. So what they've said to us and what we had to work through, for those of you who don't have the backdrop on the Interreg programme in European Finance, is they said, we'd like to give you money, but we want you to focus that money, we want you to have a much greater um, target and focus in terms of what you're doing. We want you to have a narrower band of priorities so that whenever you're investing money in a narrower band of priorities, there's a greater chance of impact being made. We need you to demonstrate that cross-border cooperation. It needs to be more intense. It's got to be the core reason for which we are doing this work. And there's got to be enhanced value in terms of what we are doing because of the cross-border cooperation and delivery of these projects. So the Commission, they're absolutely 100% behind us, but we have got to make sure that whenever we are delivering this finance, at the end and during the period that we're doing that, we can actively articulate back what the difference is that it's making to our communities and so that the Commission can ultimately say to the ratepayers, we've taken your money, we have reinvested your money and given it back to you and look what we've been able to do and achieve through doing that process. So the programmes then need to be concentrated and focused, which we've now got. We have taken down what was quite a disparate um, programme within the current programming period, which spanned quite a number of areas. That has been concentrated down into a smaller number of areas, which I'll show to you in a few minutes. We have got a clear result orientation We've had to identify measurable output, and you may find that as I'm talking about these this morning, you may agree with some of them. You may also find that with some of them, you may think, well, actually, I disagree with that output. I would have done it differently. I've no doubt that there will be instances where you would say that. But what's identified now within the cooperation programme is, in effect, what the Commission have said that they are prepared to buy. 
So it's, this time around, it, it almost feels slightly more to us as if we're going through a number of tendering processes where we're saying, These, this is what we need to achieve, this is what we're, hope, what we're hoping to deliver. Who would like to come forward to deliver that with us and how can we best do that for maximum impact and best value for money? The Commission have set out a process by which we're identifying that. So we have what is being called an intervention logic, and I'll show you how that works in a moment, whereby we have high-level objectives, which are broken into a result, which we're trying to achieve, and then a number of output indicators. And I'll explain what that means for you as potential applicants in a moment. And what the Commission have said is that for each of the outputs that we have identified and which they have agreed to and approved within the programme, they've said, if you do not deliver we may penalise your project and your programme and take a slice off the programme for non-delivery. So we are absolutely focused on making sure that we do deliver the outputs that are identified within the cooperation programme because we do not want to lose any of the programme budget at all and we don't want to lose anything out of this 53 million for health from the ERDF perspective. Now that doesn't mean that we cannot try new things. It does not mean that we should not strive to be... Um, forward thinking and you know reaching out to achieve what maybe we're worried can we do it we still need to strive to do the best that we can do but we also need to keep an eye on what is realistic and make sure that we have a, a really good plan of activity which is a deliverable plan which can be delivered within the time frame and within the budget outlined so as i said we have a policy context within which we are working at a European level, we have the Europe 2020 strategy, which is all about smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. That's broken down then into cohesion policy, which sets out how we can look at sustainable development, job creation and economic growth right across the region. We've had to fit the cooperation programme within that kind of policy context at a European level. And then we deliver out the programmes to try and deliver that European agenda. So everything that we're doing at the local level kind of all rolls back up into the European context. And what you'll hear in a moment from our colleagues here in terms of the um, national governments is it also needs to fit within a national government uh, policy context as well. In terms of where we're at now, with Interreg, we have a um, partnership agreement ad agreed between each of the member states in terms of how all of this is going to work. The Interreg programme is adopted and approved. We are now given the formal approval on behalf of the Commission to open that programme. We're working through all of the various different audit um, checks that we have to do with the audit authority to demonstrate that we've got a robust, fair, open and transparent process in place by which we're going to make decisions and deliver out on these programmes and enough security and processes in place whereby we can stand over and ensure that the money is accounted for at the end and that we can demonstrate that it's been spent against what was originally intended. So we're live and ready to go in effect, and that's why we're hoping here to have a conversation with you today. We're having that conversation slightly ahead of the programme um, opening the health call, but we thought it was useful, particularly with the level of interest that was being shown. We wanted to give you early warning, explain to you the opportunities that were coming up, and give you as much time as we could to start establishing what your ideas might want to be and who you may wish to partner with in the delivery of some of those projects. So in terms of Interreg 5, we have an eligible area, which is on the map. We have got Northern Ireland. At this time around, we're including Belfast, which is wonderful. So we now have full um, inclusion of all of Northern Ireland. We have got the border region of Ireland, and we also have Western Scotland as identified on the map. And the full detail of that, again, is within the citizen <coughs> summary and also within the cooperation programme. Our budget for the Interreg 5A programme is 240 million euros, which sounds like quite a lot, which is wonderful but when you start breaking it down against a number of thematic areas and over a five to seven year period, you start realizing actually there's a lot of difficult decisions that we're gonna to have to take as well. In terms of the European component, the European grant aid, this time we've been able to offer up to 85% grant aid from the European Commission against funded projects. Last time around it was 75%, this time it's 85, which again is wonderful. But it means that the overall complement of the programme in terms of value of the programme may be slightly less because there's only 15% additional match funding potentially coming in. What I should say, however, is that if we are delivering projects and activities which have got a private sector dimension where there's um, delivery of service which is close to market, 
This may come into the um, therapeutic trials type aspect of the health program as a possibility. If there's something where there's a private sector aspect, we will have to consider state aid. And if any of you don't know what that means, I, again, I would encourage you to go and find it out. Um, and state aid basically means that we're not allowed to provi uh, provide an anti-competitive advantage to one company over another. And we may need to adjust the grant rate to, within what is deemed to be appropriate by the European Commission just to make sure that we are not infringing any of the rules. Now, I think for the majority of the health uh, theme within this program, it's not going to be a major issue, but I'm just flagging it for you just that you have it there as a reference point in the back of your mind. 20% of the budget can be spent outside the eligible area. However, this is the exception, not the rule, and if there is finance being spent outside the eligible area, we will want to understand what is the benefit back to the eligible area. So, for example, it may mean that you would want to partner with someone, uh, an organisation in another country, another jurisdiction, who is doing something which is another added dimension to what you're trying to deliver, where you're learning from best practice, where maybe they're trialling one thing, you're trialling another, and between the two of you, you're trying to come up with the best way forwards. So there are opportunities there, but you would need to prevent, pre, uh, present a very strong rationale for why you would be bringing in activity and partners outside the eligible area and what benefit that actually brings to this particular program and uh, the area in which we're working. In terms of the um, way in which you need to establish partnership, I'll explain a little bit more in a moment, but it needs to be cross-border. The first thing I need to say is Northern Ireland, Scotland does not count. You must have Northern Ireland, 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 Scotland, but preferably all three. Because we are trying to make sure that we are investing across the region, we are providing maximum benefit and value to all of the residents and the citizens within that region who are paying into this program, in effect through their taxes. So we want to make sure that we are making an investment which is open and available to all and where the benefit is going back in across the region. So just use that as your backdrop. You know, if, if you feel that that's a tripartite project does not work for a particular reason, that's fine. But again, explain why not. Give us that understanding, give us that rationale when you're coming forward and we're actively trying to ensure that we are delivering right across the region and that we have really good, meaningful tripartite projects. Okay, everybody with me so far? All right, so just to give you a sense of what's in the Interreg programme in its entirety, I know you're here to talk about health today, that's fine, but it's just useful to know where it sits alongside everything else. <coughs> so we have a number of priorities within uh, the programme. The first one is research and innovation. This might be of interest to some of you. You, you may see some um, complementarity here. We've got research and innovation, um, two component parts, uh, and a total budget there of 61 million euros for delivery of that. Out of that, 45 million of that is for research and innovation, um, primarily focused at high le third level uh, academic um, graded research. Primarily focused in two areas, one is renewable energy, but the other is within life sciences. So there may be some complementarity with what we aim to deliver within the health sector to what could also be delivered in partnership between academic institutions and also then bringing that within the health sector as well. We also have an element there within that um, dimension of the program which is orientated towards small to medium sized companies. Um, so that aspect is there as well. We then have another strand uh, in relation to the environment and there's actually quite a number of elements to that which cover everything from water treatment and water sewage infrastructure to river basin uh, and water, uh, fresh water quality management, habitats and biodiversity, and also management of the marine environment as well. So there's a total uh, fund there of 72 million euros for the uh, environment theme. We have sustainable transport, which is looking at low carbon transport, and that brings in multimodal transport hubs, electric vehicle infrastructure, and also the development of um, green cycleways, which again has a parallel and complementarity to the health theme in terms of positive health promotion. And that's uh, 40 million euros invested within that sustainable transport theme. And then finally, the bit that you're here for today, we've got the health theme with 53 million euros allocated out of the um, program budget. And that's for the delivery of health. And I'm going to talk to you about the detail of that as we go through this morning. But you can access the information on the other aspects, both within your citizen summary document and also then online in the cooperation program itself. So looking specifically then at the health budget, 
As we said, it's 53 million euros, which is the European investment, but because there's a need for 15% match finance coming in, it means that the total investment within this sector from the programme will end up totaling close to 61 million euros. Okay. Said 85% European applicants will be required to identify 15% match finance uh, in respect of the eligible project costs. And what we are doing at the moment is we are having conversations with our departmental colleagues in Northern Ireland and Ireland who in the past had provided some match funding towards um, activities being delivered as to whether or not that opportunity will be available again in this programme. Um, we're just working through the final detail of that, but we are looking at that at the moment, and it's, uh, I think the indications are that, yes, they will try certainly to provide some finance. However, if you can bring something of your own to the table, it is very much um, welcomed, sought after, and it's also a demonstration of commitment of your partnership to the project concept, and it also demonstrates value for money in that the investment that's having to come from central resource is lower, and we can consider how that contribution comes in, both in terms of uh, monetary uh, allocation, but also contribution in kind in terms of resources that are being made available to the project. For those partners that are based in Scotland, it has always traditionally been that Scottish partners have always brought their own match finance, and I think, Eddie, that situation is continuing in the, the new programme. So just that you're aware that there is a slight distinction there, but within Northern Ireland and Ireland, we are working with the departments to see if some finance can be made available. If that is the case, we will make that known at the time of the call. We will confirm that, and you will be able to ask for that match funding through our own application process. You will not need to go separately to the accountable departments to seek that. We will manage that process as part of our overall process and facilitate that for you and make sure that then that finance is managed. So if you were getting a grant under the program, we would channel the match funding and work that through our own financial systems and allocate that out along with the grant aid just to try and make everybody's lives that little bit easier. Not ours, unfortunately, but hopefully it will make it slightly easier for yourselves. Okay, so in terms of the intervention logic, um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a process by which the Commission have asked us to kind of break down the programme. So we have an objective here, which is the high level objective that the Commission asked us to set, and that is that through collaboration on a cross border basis, we are aiming to improve the health and well being of people living in the region by enabling them to access quality health and social care services in the most appropriate setting to their needs. So that is our overriding objective, aspiration and intent through the delivery of this theme of the programme. We then have to say, well, what is the result of that going to be? And the result is that we're going to have an increased number of episodes of health, community and social care delivered on a cross-border basis. And then below that again, we have a number of specific outputs. And there are output indicators for each of the different strands of the health um, theme, which I'll talk to you about in, the, uh, in a moment. The key thing that you need to understand and know as an applicant whenever you're looking at how this intervention logic works is we will be reporting back to the European Commission on the results indicator. So that is the one that we have to stay focused on. We'll be reporting back, indicating to the Commission how many additional episodes of care have been delivered. As an applicant, while you need to be aware that that is what our overriding priority is, your application will focus on the output indicator and that's what you will be measured against. So when you're looking at your, your application, look at the output indicator, and that's what you're bidding in to deliver, and then you need to construct your project in a way that you can track your delivery of that output as you go through the delivery of your project. Hopefully that makes sense. I'll explain the output indicators for you in a minute, and maybe that will kind of consolidate it. But just be aware that there's different tiers. We'll report on results. You focus on outputs. But the output should hopefully help us to deliver the result. So that's the result indicator there. We have a number of strands then in terms of what we're calling sort of critical uh, intervention areas um, which are available under the health theme. These are identified within the programme. They were identified through the course of the consultation process, discussions with departmental colleagues. They are now what is established within the programme and from Brenda and my perspective, we are now tasked with the responsibility of delivering out against it. If you don't see your project idea here represented within this list, I'm very sorry. This is the list that we are working against and that we will be delivering. And if you're not fitting, then unfortunately you may not find an opportunity within this program. Hopefully, however, the majority of you will find an opportunity here and you will see where you can um, deliver very meaningful activity 
within the confines of what the programme has it outlined. So we have a range of areas which we can deliver against. Um, I'll run down through them, and then there are output indicators against each one. Sorry, this may be a little long-winded, but I just think it's useful to set the scene in terms of you picking out the specific area that you will maybe want to consider. So the first one is population health, and that's really focused in on supporting positive health and well-being and the prevention of ill health. So that one's quite a broad, open area in terms of what is possible and the way that you might want to orientate your activities. We then also have disability services. And really what we're looking at is trying to deal with the issues that many people who face disabilities um, have in terms of isolation, exclusion, difficulty in terms of accessing service. So we're looking there at trying to provide more equality for those that are living with disability and trying to make sure that they have better life outcomes and better access and opportunity. We then have mental health services, and what we're looking at is promoting on a cross-border basis mental, emotional resilience and recovery. We have children's services, and that's looking at early intervention with vulnerable families, primarily focusing at the under five years population. We've got primary care and older people services, and that's looking at supporting caring communities and independent living. And then we also have acute services there as well. And that's really looking at new models of working and scheduled, non-scheduled care streams and really how we can better utilise the resources that we have, whether those are human, whether they are physical, whether they are financial, and trying to deal with the inefficiencies that the border sometimes pushes into the delivery of acute care services. How can we allow for better mobility, better access to care in terms of what it is that people need? So what I'll just do, for those of you, you can listen up when you hear the bit that you're interested in and just allow yourself to go to sleep for the other sections. I'm just going to run down through what the output indicators are for each of those different areas. And this is the way that it's defined within the cooperation programme. So the first one then, and you'll see with some of these, there's two aspects to it. One is number of interventions, and the other then is the number of beneficiaries that are identified. Now, some of you might immediately say, well, what is an intervention? Good question. It's not defined at the moment within the cooperation program. And you might immediately think, well, that's not very helpful because I'd like to know exactly what that means. Um, to a degree, we support that argument. However, the converse is the fact that it is not completely defined within the cooperation program gives us flexibility and approach. So, so long as we can identify that it is an intervention, then we should have some flexibility in how we define what that is but we'll be actively interested with your project application in understanding what you are terming an intervention uh, to be. The beneficiaries then is looking at individual patients and clients who are in receipt of service. Now, one of the things, and Brenda will talk you through the practicalities and the management later on in terms of application, one of the key things that we'll be looking at within the health sector is how do we track the delivery of service to beneficiaries and it presents all kinds of challenges there in terms of um, freedom of, inform of information, data protection, and so on. Just to put your minds at rest straight away, as an organization with an SUPB, we do not want to get patient records on any individual whatsoever. But when you're uh, pulling together your project, what we need you to understand is you will need to have a mechanism by which you can track how you, the, uh, the individual. So we'd be asking you to set up some kind of unique identifier for each individual patient and client that would receive access to service, whereby we can audit the fact that there, an individual has gone through the service that you're providing, and we can adequately report back to the Commission on the number of people that have received service, but we do not want to get the details on who, where, what they've got in terms of the data protection aspects of that. So on population health, what we have here is um, cross-border interventions to support positive health and well-being. There's a target there for 12 interventions to be delivered through the course of the program. And we have a target of 15,000 beneficiaries that will re have received some form of positive health and well-being service, which helps them to prevent ill health. So that is the target for that particular dimension of this theme. Similarly, under mental health, we have a target there for the development of new cross-border area community and voluntary sector infrastructure to support clients who have recovered from mental illness. And you'll see referenced throughout all of these, the whole issue of e-health, um, accessing and using 
new technologies and how we can build that in to help support the activities that are being delivered. So we have a target here in terms of mental health of one infrastructure um, in terms of that uh, new um, service area. And in terms of the number of patients and clients, there's a target there of 8,000 clients will have received some form of service um, by the time we complete out on this area of the programme. On primary care and older people services, um, we have a target of 4,500 patients and clients to have received some form of additional support and care. And then under acute services, there's a number of elements here. We've got cross-border frameworks where we're looking at how we can better deliver on a cross-border basis um, some of the care forms. We have also got the number of patients who need to have received service through those different forms of care. And we also then need to look at the um, identification, assessment and referral of clients. So we have got four frameworks identified here. We have got a target of 15,000 patients to have received care. And we also then have a target of 2,500 interventions, which are looking at the issues of um, assessment and referral of elderly patients identified as being at risk of isolation and social exclusion. So those are the specific targets in underneath the acute services area. Then we've got disability services, two new disability services actively supporting those that are living with different forms of disability, and also the number of beneficiaries. And we're targeting here 4,000 beneficiaries at being able to um, access cross-border area initiatives. And under children's services, we have a target of two new frameworks or two new sort of ways of working um, with vulnerable families and that we're looking to deliver interventions with 5,000 families, again, across the region, who are then accessing some additional support and dealing with the issues that they are having to live with. One of the other aspects to the programme, which is slightly different to where we were within the current programming period, is we have an opportunity within this programming period as well to look at the development, implementation and evaluation of health and social care trials in a range of healthcare areas. Now, this is new for us. It's very exciting for us. We're actively really looking to get involved in this. And I think it is a particular benefit to the area in which we are working in terms of geographical area. Because what we tend to see sometimes is that some of the therapeutic trial type work that's on, underway is very much centered around um, large um, urban centers. And it can be difficult for those that are living within a more rural border location, Western Scotland, sometimes to access some of those opportunities that might be available to people living in a more urbanised setting. So we do have an opportunity here to also look at therapeutic trials as we deliver out on this theme. And what we have here is the development of infrastructure and also how we can then look at intervention trials for what is being termed as novel but unproven healthcare interventions to support and cure illness. So that's a new area for the programme, but it's one that we're very excited about. And we have a target here of different, 10 different trials of new forms of care. Also within the programme, and we're looking and we're still in conversation with our departmental colleagues about how we embed this within the thematic area and what needs to be a separate call um, in terms of what's a specific area of intervention. So those conversations are ongoing. But for yourselves as applicants, just to reference and make you aware, there are two areas which at the moment we're kind of looking at as almost being and should be nearly cross-cutting themes across all the other sort of intervention areas. One is about the training of uh, healthcare professionals and also the aspect of how we look at electronic record keeping, record sharing, making sure that that is available. Although I know that there are conversations ongoing as well from the departmental perspective about the whole issue of electronic record capture and, and information sharing. So that one we're looking at in, in great detail at the moment. But there is an underlying kind of theme here in terms of avail of new technology and make sure that our staff are adequately trained up to deliver. What I would say, however, and this is the guidance coming through from our managing authority within SUPB, who constructed and agreed this programme with the European Commission, when we're talking about um, training interventions here, we're not necessarily talking about technical training intervention in terms of training within the 
particular care stream. The training needs to be about how do we deliver this in a meaningful way on a cross-border basis and how do we make that service work in a practical way. So don't start looking at a huge degree of it being orientated at training up people to deliver you know, an, an additional training within a, a particular care stream. It's about how do we work together and how do we make the cross-border dimension of this add value and deliver out uh, in its entirety. Now, obviously, we're happy to have conversations with you in and around what that may mean for you and what needs to be built in as training, but just keep that slight kind of um, caveat in the back of your mind. So I've talked down through that. You will see in the cooperation program that that's broken down into a number of indicative actions um, there. So I leave you to read through that at your leisure. Um, it really just covers what I've already talked about, but it's just broken down into a number of different aspects. And those indicative actions are fully detailed within the cooperation program. You'll also see them within the, the citizen summary. And it's just how it's defined within the program in terms of each of the different intervention areas, the key aim and ethos behind those areas and what we are hoping to achieve as we go forwards. So who can apply? Lots of people can apply. Um, to be honest with you, there's probably not very many people who are excluded from applying unless you don't have a legal entity and have a means by which you can engage with us in a contractual way and receive a letter of offer. So it is there that many um, opportunities for um, organizations to get involved and develop an application. However, it is fair to say, and it's detailed within the cooperation program there, that this is primarily orientated, and we see the main beneficiaries out of this theme of the program being the public sector and non-governmental organizations. So that is what we're anticipating coming forward um, to us. What you need to be aware of, however, is just in terms of that um, cross-border partnership, um, I've referenced the geographical mix in terms of your partners. Um, it is very important that whenever you're coming forward with an application that you can demonstrate that you've got good corporate governance and partnership arrangements. We want to understand who are you working with, why are you working with them, how are they the best people in terms of your partnership coming forward in the organisations, why is that the best partnership that should be coming forward to deliver on this project? So can you demonstrate expertise in this area? Can you demonstrate previous history in delivering? Can you demonstrate that the partnership works well together? You must be able to demonstrate that there's a reason for you to be working on a cross-border basis. It is not sufficient to say, we're going to do this in Northern Ireland, we're going to do something similar in Ireland, and we're going to do something similar again in Scotland, and isn't that wonderful? Yes, it might be wonderful. I'm sure it probably is very wonderful. But there needs to be a reason for why Interreg is financing it, and the core remit of Interreg is about cross-border collaboration, cross-border added value. What is the benefit for you in delivering what you're aiming to deliver on a cross-border basis? That's absolutely crucial, and you will see as Brenda talks through the scoring criteria for application assessment. It's in there. It's a major component. Please bear it in mind. In terms of cross-border partnership, um, there are some mandatory essential criteria here. There's also some optionals. I would say even when it's optional, it's better if you can make it mandatory for yourselves because it just adds weight to your application. Partnerships must be able to demonstrate joint project development and implementation. Those are essential. And when we're talking about joint implementation, it's not sufficient to say we're going to get together once a year and I'm going to hear what they've done and they're, I'm going to tell them what I've done. That will not work. So it needs to be about real joint implementation and development. And then you've got two here which are identified as being an either or or a possible and. I would say make an and wherever you possibly can. So that is you must demonstrate either joint staffing and joint financing. So if you can do both, definitely that is the best possible way forward, but it can be an either or on those two. Just to reference for you, in terms of partnership formation, somebody is going to have to take the lead. So we will need a lead partner who will, in effect, be the organisation who steps forward to make the application to ourselves. That will be the organisation that we establish a contract with through a letter of offer to deliver out on the project which we agree to finance. That lead partner is then responsible for making sure that it's delivered. The lead, the lead organization, we will pay them, and you will then be responsible for disaggregating any money that comes out around all the other project partners. You're also responsible for making sure that everybody else stays on track and to time, 
and just making sure that you're capturing the information in terms of those beneficiaries and that that reporting process is properly coordinated. So the key things then really are projects, make sure there's a joint benefit in working together to tackle a shared problem, make sure that you're all involved in the development of the application, that there's a benefit and that you're delivering more out of that cross-border partnership than you would be on delivering by yourself. Your project must have clear results, tangible outputs, and it must have a relevance to all of the regions in which you're aiming to work. You need to have a clear plan for delivery. Brenda will talk to you a bit more about that later. You need to are prepared to dig in and work together. And it's better if you like each other. It's not mandatory. You may not. You might like each other at the start and decide halfway through, well, actually, we're not that keen. But you need to be able to stick together, work it through, and that everybody is actively going to deliver. So if you've got an organization who's saying, you know what, we're not really sure if this is going to fit within our key priorities and our key agenda. This, we'd like to be involved, but we're really not sure whether we can be in there. Have very serious conversation about that at the outset and make sure that it is something that everybody is actively wanting to commit to and deliver out for the entirety of the duration that you're going to be delivering this project. Make sure that you have a clear and transparent management process for how you're going to work together to deliver that. If you're clear about that at the outset, it will tell untold benefits for you through the course of delivery and it will offset a lot of difficulties and make the experience a really good, positive one for all of the project partners involved. You'll need to be able to communicate your results and outputs for us. Don't be afraid of trying new things. We are looking for innovation, but make sure that we can actively track the fact that you have delivered and you will need to be complementary to what's happening at a European level and at a national policy level as well. We're not going to go into application process now. What I'm going to do is invite, I think John, you're coming up, and I think there may be um, some others coming with you. I'm going to invite our national um, policy colleagues here from a departmental perspective, just to set the scene in terms of the national priorities just a reference for you, um, these guys will be uh, represented on the steering committee. They are going to be there actively helping to support us through this process. It's therefore very worthwhile listening to what they have to say because this is the backdrop within which we will be working to deliver out on this theme. John. Okay, just get your slides. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm John Farrell from the Department of Health uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, but before I sort of start to give you the shared perspective across the three departments, I think it would be maybe helpful if I invited uh, colleagues from Scotland and from Ireland just to come up and say 30 seconds who they are, where their area of interest is, and it sort of helps to break down the barriers maybe if you want to talk to any of us later on. So maybe Margaret and Audrey, could I invite you up just to introduce yourselves? Thanks, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Wariski, and I'm here from the Scottish Government. And I think we're really sort of delighted to be involved in this um, collaboration. And I know it is extending the traditional border between the North of Ireland and the Republic to include some parts of Scotland. But we think there's going to be great benefit in terms of collaboration, knowledge exchange, and shared learning. And I guess we have a particular interest in community resilience and that wider preventative agenda, and I think particularly in sort of areas for more rural rurality and remoteness. So we think there's lots of uh, synergies and uh, how technology can play a role in enabling some of the transformation um, and innovation that we need to do. So thank you and look forward to discussing further during the day. Good morning everybody. My name is Audrey Haggerty and I work in the International Unit in the Department of Health in Dublin. Um, I suppose I was mindful that, I, that John might be putting us forward for a few words. Um, so I suppose no more than yourselves, I had a look to see a bit more about Interreg and the background to it. And um, it may have been mentioned earlier, but I was intrigued to learn that uh, 2015 is actually um, the 25th anniversary of um, this programme in Europe and I suppose it just got me thinking a little bit about the whole purpose of it and how it's applicable today. Um, interesting that in all that time it's been about achieving the cross-border collaboration across I suppose all member states and to remove border obstacles um, to find shared um, I suppose means of addressing common and shared challenges and I suppose health 
is a, a very particular one where there are common challenges across you know, Europe and between our member states, um, but also bearing in mind then that our member states have possibly you know, different health systems, how they operate. Um, so it, it's, I suppose it's, um, it, it's one that there are challenges, but as I say, uh, because they're common challenges, that the Interreg is very well placed, I think, to support us in our work on that. Um, Lorraine mentioned the uh, Commission, and I suppose there are quite a number of players in this this program. Uh, the Commission, um, Lorraine's al already mentioned about their input and that they hope to receive, I suppose, ma maximum um, benefit from their input, no more than the member states themselves. Um, but I think, as has been highlighted, there are quite a lot of obligations on those who put forward applications. And we'll hear more, I suppose, later on. Um, for Ireland, we recognise the importance of ERD, ERDF in um, supporting our economic and uh, social development, and obviously regional development. Um, just to mention, too, about the health systems, um, there's been mention of the cooperation programme and the operational programme, both the same thing. Um, it's, it's not so much difficult to read, but I actually do think it's actually a very good backdrop to what we're actually trying to achieve through the programme. I actually would encourage people to, to look at it. I think it gives some very good pointers to, you know, to what the programme is about and why uh, the various governments are interested in supporting it. It also recognises the contrasting nature of the borders in the eligible areas and that there are different approaches to promoting cross-border co cooperation. So just to reiterate what's been said already, it's about finding means of collaboration where that collaboration makes sense. Um, and obviously, you know, the added value element is, is what, what we want to see. Finally, don't want to um, hog the, the, the floor for John, but just to mention the people aspect to all of this and the citizen and the patient, um, I suppose a key element of this programme is building on the previous programmes. And the previous programmes um, have been very good at bringing people together, not only in terms of service delivery, but bringing professional, professionals together and managing the process together. So I think people are key to this programme and will be key to its success. Um, I think it's the essence, really, of the cross-border activity, really. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, the rest of the, the, the programme and of what it means for us all. Um, we've worked together to prepare some um, high-level idea of what it is that the departments would like to see in terms of guiding principles. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Audrey and Margaret. The first question I always ask is, how do I move the slides on? Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, okay. I can wave it, John. Uh, no, that's okay. That's all right. Um, okay. What I want to do is to provide a perspective um, across the three departments. As Lorraine has already said, there's been a lot of engagement uh, across the three departments in, in terms of moving forward on this agenda. And we see the opportunities that Interreg bring to actually letting us you know, address maybe a, a current challenge that is maybe facing patients in the eligible area. And there is a sort of a difference uh, in it all in that because of the size of Northern Ireland, you know, all of Northern Ireland is the eligible area. Whereas we have the border counties in Ireland and we have the western uh, of, of Scotland and the Isles. And that means completely different dynamics and some of the conversations I've been having with other colleagues in the other jurisdictions is that when we look to see the change that affects the patients in our eligible area, we have to be mindful that whilst that is all of our population in Northern Ireland, it's only part of the population in Scotland or in Ireland. So when we look to sort of align things into where we're going at our national strategies, we have to be mindful that there are particular challenges on the border area that may not be the same throughout the rest of the country. But equally, we are in an era where health uh, and social care is having to respond better to the needs of patients. It needs to be having services designed around the needs of patients. And therefore, the challenges of developing health and care in a modern society are equally as challenging throughout a whole country as they are in a particular region of that country. So there has to be lessons that can be taken, adopted, applied and scaled up to, in, in order to meet national agendas and strategies. But some of the challenges that, that we are facing, and in a lot of respects, we are not uh, 
unique just because we're in these three jurisdictions. Um, the work that I do, working with all the European regions, I actually find a lot of the challenges, we're all the same. We're all finding that our populations are getting older. Right across Europe, that is the case. And with an older population, you also find then that people are living longer because health and care today is much better than it was years ago. But with people living longer, you start to find that there are certain disease types, there are certain things that start to affect them. So you have chronic conditions that start to appear with the patients that would be associated with it, with, with the rising population. And what we actually find is that, I think it's in the last 20 years or so, from a non-iron perspective, there's been a 21% increase in the number of people over the age of 65. And when you think of that, that they are actually needing more health and care services, they're actually probably going to have uh, more chronic conditions like diabetes, respiratory conditions, uh, mobility issues and that there. We still need to provide for those needs of those patients. And what that actually does is that that puts pressures on our financial systems because we still, because of people living longer, we still need to provide care for them, providing different care. We need to start to look about doing it in a different way in order to do all of that. And that sort of takes us into, you know, should there be differences in the way care is provided to patients? No, everybody should have access to the same type of care. Accessibility to care can cause inequalities, and we need to be able to ensure we address that. And you will find out that maybe in the border region, in remote and rural areas, it is increasingly difficult for patients to be able to access the type of care that they need. So we need to actually think of how do we do all of that in terms of, of, of moving it forward. And this is where there are some common goals uh, for, for health and social care that sort of come out from, uh, from Interreg, but they're also shared across the three departments. You know, the three key things that we would actually see from a health and care perspective is we need to do things that improve the health of the population, improve the quality and the safety of the services that are actually provided to the population, and we need to ensure that the services are resilient and provide value for money. And that's the challenges that we're working towards, and that's, the, that's what we're actually trying to structure our strategies and policies around in order to do all of that and to give it. We need to see a much greater focus on prevention on self-management, if we can actually get patients to take responsibility for the care much earlier, then there is less likelihood that they will actually sort of fall into needing direct medical intervention at a later point. So we can do things like, you know, showing people how nutrition, diet is important to them so you reduce the risks of obesity. You know, smoking, we shouldn't smoke, I smoke, Okay, so there's public health messages I maybe need to listen to, but smoking is also another issue. So if we can address those issues, we actually can keep people out of the health system, get them to self-manage their care. Even where they have presented with a condition, maybe there is the opportunity to use technology so that the patient can actually manage their own conditions at home and enable the data that is actually being gathered on them to be transmitted into the health and care service and monitored that way. And you can have the intervention with the patient at the right time you could lead to reduced emergency admissions into hospital as well as a result of that. So there is a rule in, in, in sort of it all moving forward that we need to be innovative, innovative in how we actually design our services and how we actually apply technology to those services. And I'm not for one minute saying that every new service that comes forward has to have a technology component to it. That's not going to be applicable or right in every situation, but innovation is key in the delivery of all services. Because with a, a population that is living longer, with pressures on budget, we need to look at how we do things and how we can do them differently. And how, through that, we actually can get better outcomes for patients at the end of the day. It's not suffice to continue to do it and deliver similar outcomes and still be faced with the health challenges we have. We have to improve the outcomes for patients through all of this. <clears throat> Across the, the, the three jurisdictions, um, you know, it's important to sort of recognise that there are some key things that are important to us. We are all reforming our health and social care systems. That's a fact. And it's probably, you should be hearing about it through the media, you should be hearing, reading about it in the newspapers. That is a fact. We are having to reform our health and social care systems. We are having to develop systems that are designed around the needs of patients not what the health sector thinks the patient needs, 
but what does the patient need for that service that they require. So it's provided in the right place, at the right time, by the right professional, and leads to improved patient outcomes. Sorry. Yeah. One of the other things as well is we also have strategies that are particular to our different client areas. So whenever Lorraine was going through the various indicators and she was talking about population health and mental health and acute services, we have strategies and policies in these areas. It is important that many proposals that are coming forward are mindful of what the three governments are saying in terms of the strategies and policies in these areas because it's important that proposals come forward that deliver on these. If they don't deliver on them, then it's going to be very difficult to actually say that it, it, it does meet an unmet need with patients or it will deliver on improved patient outcomes. So I would sort of say that there is an, expe an expectation on behalf of the three departments that any proposal coming in will actually take account of, of our policies and strategies in these areas and be able to demonstrate, not just that we know that the policy and strategy is there, how will you deliver against that for us? So there are a number of principles that we sort of would be looking towards whenever the applications are, are, are being made, and we would hope that these would sort of offer some sort of help to anybody that is actually putting together a proposal. Um, the proposal, you should be able to sort of align the proposal with the strategies and the policies and areas that you're, that you're wanting to go after. So how does it link into our population health strategies and, pro and policies? But not just in one jurisdiction. How does it deliver across the jurisdictions that you want your application to apply to? That's what's important. You have to be able to demonstrate as well or show how you will actually, uh, through the, the, the proposal, uh, improve the value for money in the area. And that'll come maybe by service redesign, by innovation. And I think this is one of the important things and, and you know, picking up on something that Audrey had actually said, you know, this is about building on the success of what went before. I would add to that and actually say that it's building on the success of what went before by learning from that to design and redesign and reconfigure the services so that we actually adopt innovative approaches to the delivery of that. We use technology, whatever that technology is, in order to respond to that as an enabler. And that's where we add value to it, the whole process going forward. It's also in terms of the quality of the cross-border cooperation. We want to actually see something living, breathing, coming out of this here. So we do as well. The improved outcomes for citizens, I don't know how many, many times I've mentioned it, I don't think I keep needing to remind it, remind us of it, but it is important that you can demonstrate how this will improve the outcomes for patients coming forward. The um, other set of, of principles that we've been looking for uh, in, in it is that um, it has to take account of the reform agendas. What are the reform agendas in the three jurisdictions saying? You need to be mindful of that. There are the documents in Northern Ireland that's transforming your care. Um, within Ireland and within Scotland, they will have similar in there as well. So you need to be mindful of what that's saying and how we're actually trying to, to bring about the change of the services. But what I would say, the key message is the right service in the right place at the right time delivered by the right health professional that delivers better outcomes. If you keep that in mind, you'll probably not be too far off the shared reform objectives. Innovation and transformation, we want to see that coming through. We don't want to just come back and tell us we're going to do it this way, and that's the way it traditionally was done. We want, to, we want to see this drive for innovation. We want to see the change because what we want out of this is that whilst we're actually looking at the, the, the projects and the applications coming forward and meeting the needs of the patients within that, what we would like to see is maybe something new coming forward that can be adopted at a bigger scale that can actually change the whole way we maybe address the delivery of health and care services within the whole of the country, not just within an eligible area. And we want to be able to see something that can come through as well, that we can actually start to assemble an evidence base that can actually say it delivers better patient outcomes, it can be done more efficiently and effectively. And it could be attractive to actually take Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland into broader partnerships with other European regions in order to really start to embed some of the innovation that will come through in the service delivery. So very much 
this can be seen as a, as a first step in to actually making real effective, long-lasting change. Schemes, change that can be embedded, change that can be scaled up, not just contained and confined to where it actually happens in the project, but scaled up. And the other important factor going forward is that at the end of the Interreg 5 period, those patients that have benefited from the application, from the project proposals going forward, shouldn't find that the service has suddenly stopped. That does not work for patients. What happens is that it has to be mainstreamed, so we need to be able to build these into the future delivery programs of health and care in the eligible areas. Think of the patient and think what they need after 2020. Are we going to stop it or are we going to continue it? So you need to be able to demonstrate how you can actually ensure that the service is mainstreamed. And that will probably necessitate conversations with the health services and the health sectors in the relevant jurisdictions to ensure that things can be delivered and taken forward. I sort of hope at the end of, 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 of that that it is maybe sort of given some clear thoughts in terms of what the departments would like to get out of the process. Summary, better patient outcomes, greater use of innovation, and services, services designed around the needs of the individual. Thank you very much.